Greetings and a warm welcome to a presidential conversation preserving the legacy of our historically black colleges and universities. This session is brought to you by the African American Cultural Heritage Fund at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We are honored, we are privileged to have three distinguished university college presidents with us for this session. We have Mr. Dr. Cynthia Warwick, Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, Dr. Logan Hampton, Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. And certainly Dr. Wilson, president of Morgan State University in Baltimore. But before we get underway, uh, let me again on behalf of the presidents, express our deep gratitude to Brent Legs and Cynthia Halbert at the National Trust for Historic Preservation for extending to us this warm opportunity, this very generous opportunity to share with you our thoughts, our perspective, our visions, our hopes, our dream about the future of preserving the legacy of our, of our historically black colleges and universities. So let's, uh, let's get started. I uh, I'm honored, I'm humbled to serve as your moderator, and uh, I'm a graduate of a uh, historically black university, Houston Tillerson University in Austin, Texas. And if I were sitting in a hall of Congress, I would use the expression, uh, I, would, I would ask my uh, fellow uh, presidents, I'm pointing myself as the president, uh, to maybe uh, yield the balance of their time so I could speak all, speak all afternoon about Houston Tillerson University, but that would not be appropriate. Uh, as we know, uh, our HBCUs own and steward a diverse and impressive collection of historic sites, pardon me, historic landscapes, buildings, and archives. The management and conversation of these conservation of these heritage resources are invaluable to the understanding of HBCU's legacy. It is also critically important to attract students, faculty, and administrators who seek a unique, a unique cultural and educational experience. In essence, historic preservation, whether on a formal or informal basis, can help distinguish HBCUs from other academic institutions. It really is an advantage, a competitive advantage. So let me ask our distinguished president a couple of questions at the outset. What is your perspective on historic preservation? Uh, how has your school integrated historic preservation into your broader academic mission and campus planning activities? And let me uh, start with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hampton at, uh, at Lane College. Well, well uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity in this forum and uh, an opportunity to, to tell the story of, of Lane College, historic preservation. Certainly, it's just been a part of the fabric uh, of our institution. Uh, we uh, began in 1882 as the first uh, institution of learning for the, at that point, the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church uh, in, in 1882. The church itself was founded in 1870 and you know, just fresh out of uh, slavery, just on the other side of reconstruction. Uh, our founders, um, next to soul salvation, they thought that uh, educating ministers, educating teachers that would then educate the populace was was their their highest priority. And so they set out. Uh, doing that, and and you know, I'm I'm always interested by that by that notion. Um, you know, when I think about myself, I might have had some other interests um, in 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 my own mind, and, and thinking about those who had formerly uh, forced uh, forced labor without compensation, uh, I might have had some other thought. But their thought was was to get about uh, equipping. Uh, those newly uh, free former forced laborers to to participate in society, to contribute to society, and to pursue education. 
And that process began um, um, at the beginning, at the founding of our of our institution, as 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 soon as the persons were 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 set free. And so for me, that is a that's a transforming thought and a liberating thought, and something that we ought to that we ought to celebrate. And throughout our history, uh, that has been uh, that has continued to be who it is uh, that we are, providing education and opportunity to those persons who might not have access to uh, to education, uh, helping students to fully establish the power of their of their potential. Uh, today, our, our conversation is an interesting conversation in that we talk about historic preservation and a part of our work in, in historic preservation is uh, I sit in the this space that you're looking at now uh, is one of the um, original spaces that was built uh, on our on our campus. Uh, in fact, one of our local historians uh, reminds me that uh, when Bishop Lane um, uh, raised two hundred and forty dollars to buy a property, he bought four acres uh, right here on the formerly Hayes uh, forced labor camp. And so this space where um, the building, the, the current administration building sits, uh, sits in about the same place as the quote unquote big house set. Um, as my students might say, you know, I feel some type of way about that. I'm not sure. <laughs> How, how I feel about that. But this space is, and this place, this land was, was a former, uh, the former uh, forced labor, labor camp. And it is now uh, a seat of education and has, and has been now for 140 years. And so preserving that history, I, I'm, I think every day when I wake up that, uh, that I stand on the shoulders of those 41 former forced laborers who founded our church. And then in 1878, uh, J.K. Daniels himself, who made the motion to establish a school of learning in, in Tennessee. And then Bishop Lane, who then took on the, the great work of raising the money and then founding this school. Um, every day I'm reminded as I wake on this holy hill and begin my work that I do, in fact, stand on there than on their shoulders. So historic preservation is, is more than, than just a notion for us of, of holding, uh, preserving a facility. I mean, it is, it is who we are and it is a legacy that we live and that we continue even today. Well, let me stop there. I mean, I certainly could talk on and on about our founders and uh, what, they, uh, what they intended, but I certainly want to yield time to my colleagues. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Warwick, uh, please tell us about Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Well, thank you, Mr. Stanton, and thank you, uh, colleagues, for sharing these stories. Uh, the history of Lane College is very interesting and somewhat similar to Stillman College. Stillman was founded in 1876 by the pastor of First Presbyterian Church here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, he was the white pastor at a time when the Constitution of Alabama changed to make it illegal to educate African Americans in public schools. So that ushered in Jim Crow, and he went to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church and asked to start a school to educate black ministers. He started the school in his house at first, and his house uh, is still standing. It's owned by the National Alumni Association and is in the National Register and is also an Alabama historic landmark. And then after a few years, he bought the old Cochran Plantation, uh, which is where we sit today on 105 acres which housed 71 slaves uh, in its time and during slavery. And um, the columns on the plantation house were saved to 
be placed on our current Shepherd Library, the columns and the capitals, which were imported Italian marble and wrought iron capitals. And so the history of that plantation house where they used to hold classes still remains on our campus, on the library. Uh, the, the campus is an Alabama historic landmark and we are a National Register Historic District. The three buildings contributing to the district, the oldest building being Winsboro Hall, which was built by the Presbyterian women in 1922. It's in the National Register. And then Snedeker Hall, the Presbyterian women built it as well because there was no Negro hospital in Tuscaloosa. So the Presbyterian women decided first there weren't any women at Stillman. We're going to build a girls' school and a dormitory for the girls. And then they said, well, there's no health care in the community, so we're going to build a hospital and a nursing program. And so they built Snedeker Hall. And then that's the, the third building is Shepherd Library, where uh, the capitals and columns stand. So historic preservation is very important to Stillman. It tells the history of Stillman. It tells the history of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and African Americans in this community. Most have a connection to Stillman. It's the anchor in the West End, which is the historic African American community. It uh, is the largest contiguous landowner in the community, so we are the anchor for black Tuscaloosa. And so that history is very important. And one of the things that we're doing with the support of the National Trust and the, um, the National Park Service is raising funds to restore Winsboro Hall, which is in significant disrepair. We use the library, Shepherd Library. It is um, being converted to a civil rights museum and digital learning center. So we can tell the story because there is no place in Tuscaloosa that is telling the story of Stillman. I think when people think about Alabama, they think about Birmingham and Selma. But Tuscaloosa had marches. They had a, a Bloody Tuesday that occurred prior to the Selma march. They had sit-ins, bus boycotts, all of the things that were taking place in Montgomery and Birmingham and Selma took place in Tuscaloosa. But no one knows that history, and so we, we uh, feel that Stillman will be able to share that history with the community and the nation about those same types of individuals, many who were Stillman students who participated in the marches and the National Student Coordinating Committee and the sit-ins and, you know, and certainly were injured during and arrested during Bloody Tuesday. So. This history is, is, is a history of America. It's a history that needs to be preserved, and these buildings connect us to that history. So restoring them on our campuses is, is very important. Excellent. Excellent, uh, Dr. Horby. Uh, Dr. Wilson at uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore. Please share with us uh, the history of uh, Morgan State and some of your current developments there. Uh, certainly will, Robert. And so first of all, let me express my appreciation uh, to the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, for having me uh, and President Warwick and President Hampton uh, to talk about uh, our incredible institutions and their legacies. Uh, I think this is an enormously important conversation, and I cannot think of um, a, a better place to have it uh, and a better umbrella in which this conversation will take place. Um, we at Morgan, of course, like you heard from President Hampton at Lane and President Warwick at Steelman, uh, have been around for a while. Uh, we came into existence uh, in 1867 
Uh, and of course, you know, we are in our 155th year. Um, Morgan's founding is not too dissimilar uh, from that of many of the other 100 plus HBCUs. Um, we were established by five visionary um, African American uh, ministers, um, of which uh, one of them uh, was um, newly uh, freed uh, from a, a Southern Maryland plantation, um, and his uh, master, if you will, uh, gave him his uh, freedom. Um, but uh, there was a law in place, Robert, at the time, you know, called the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, and it said that if uh, individuals were caught beyond the, uh, you know, uh, on the southern side of the Mason-Dixon line, even if they were free, you know, they could uh, be returned to their masters uh, or go to jail. And so um, one of these individuals who actually uh, was um, uh, credited with um, implanting this fire within the ministry uh, for the founding of Morgan was the late Reverend Samuel L. Green. Um, and uh, he actually uh, left that plantation uh, and uh, was caught um, by fugitive bounty hunters, if you will. Um, and uh, they sentenced him to 10 years in a Baltimore City penitentiary, of which he served five. Um, and he could read, he could write. Um, and um, his crime was that uh, he was in possession of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harry Beecher Stowe's book. And so this desire on his part to uh, establish an institution to uh, enable uh, Blacks who would be coming out of slavery uh, to cultivate their minds, um, it became even more urgent for him while he was in the penitentiary. And so when he was released out of the penitentiary, uh, he then led the movement uh, to establish the Centenary Biblical Institute, uh, which is now, of course, Morgan State University. Um, Reverend uh, Samuel Green is depicted in the movie Harriet um, and uh, was uh, there as the minister of the church uh, that actually was uh, responsible for helping Harriet Tubman uh, on numerous treks back to Maryland to free slaves. Uh, and so, um, the, the history of Morgan uh, is one that is rooted in activism. <laughs> uh, we cannot run away from that. Uh, and um, that uh, activism started, of course, with Reverend Samuel Green, and it persists at the university. It persists in terms of our curriculum. Um, it persists in terms of our structures. Um, you know, what I, what I like to say uh, about uh, our institutions, um, about HBCUs, uh, is that they really are uh, tangible uh, edifices. Uh, of the hopes and the aspirations of the slaves. Uh, and so we here at Morgan, we, like our other HBCU sisters and brothers, we understand what that means. And so it's not just about the structures, it's, it's, it's how do you uh, also uh, align curricular in a way that's gonna tell the historical story. Uh, and so um, that's what we do here. Uh, we excavate the history. Uh, we make no apology about the fact that um, when you walk our campus, uh, you cannot divorce that historic walk uh, from a walk to freedom uh, and the fight for everyone uh, to be a part of the American ideals embedded in the Constitution. Uh, and so uh, we have moved from that founding in 1867, uh, where we had uh, nine students and two professors, uh, to today where we have close to 9,000 students uh, coming from 44 states, over 70 countries. We're offering 150 academic degree programs um, and about 75% uh, of our students are African-American. Uh, and so uh, we, um, we stand um, as a very proud um, institution uh, in the American higher education landscape. Uh, and institutions like Morgan and Stillman and Lane and others, uh, they must be enhanced, they must be preserved, um, because um, if that does not happen, uh, we would almost consciously uh, be removing such an important part of our history uh, from our landscape. Uh, and we, we know that, you know, as Mao Angelo said, you know, um, you know, history you cannot be unlived. Uh, and so we are not about unliving the history, but we're about being the true storytellers of it.
Excellent, excellent. Appreciate that very much, Dr. Wilson. As all of us can appreciate, uh, our colleges and universities are, are dynamic. Uh, they continue to grow, continue to expand to meet the needs uh, of our educational uh, objectives or supporting our educational objectives and certainly uh, encouraging our, our students uh, to seek a wide variety of uh, professional uh, occupations. And recognizing that our universities, our campuses are growing, uh, what are you uh, undertaking relative to uh, assure that, the, that, that modern construction to meet current and future needs are compatible uh, with preserving the integrity uh, of buildings uh, that were constructed uh, shortly after the Civil War, if you will, and many of these buildings were constructed constructed uh, by students themselves. So, how do you maintain that historic integrity uh, of our legacy with with modern day needs? Let's start with you, uh, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> well, uh, we are uh, fortunate uh, at Morgan to. Uh, have uh, presented to the state of Maryland over the last 12 years uh, a case, you know, for state investment uh, in the capital uh, aspect of our campus. Uh, and so, Robert, you know, we're in the middle of a $1 billion uh, capital enhancement. $1 billion? Yes. Uh, one, one billion uh, capital enhancement of the campus. And if you come to the campus, you'll see uh, that in the last, oh, seven or eight years, um, we have built um, some pretty impressive uh, academic facilities and, 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 and they're still going up as I speak. Um, but one thing is extraordinarily clear to us uh, is that um, we understand those legacy buildings uh, and the stories that those legacy buildings, that those legacy buildings are telling. Um, and the new buildings must, if you will, have some kinship with those stories. They must have kinship with those stories in terms of the structures uh, and in terms of uh, what happens uh, within their walls. Uh, and so uh, because Morgan, uh, our current site, we've been on this site for 105 years, um, we were uh, built on a quarry um, in, in the sort of northeast corner at the time of Baltimore County before it was annexed into the city. Um, many of those early legacy buildings, actually, the stone came from that quarry. And that's why when you come to Morgan and you look at those legacy buildings, um, you will not see a red brick building as a part of our historic legacy here. And so with the newer buildings, um, still no red brick buildings. Um, and we try and um, create uh, some of the skin uh, on those newer buildings that is not going to be, you know, in an architectural fight, if you will, uh, with the legacy buildings. Um, that's just baked into our master plan, uh, and the Board of Regents expects us to execute it. Um, the faculty is expecting that. The students are expecting that. Certainly our alumni, you know, who um, have those experiences in those legacy buildings. I mean, they really thrive, and they're happy with all of the contemporary facilities that we're seeing, but they pay a lot of attention and make sure that those are not standing out like a sore thumb. Uh, and so to conclude, you know, we are doing two things. Number one, uh, we are uh, carefully orchestrating a master plan uh, to renovate some of our legacy buildings, um, saving the exterior, the skin, but bringing them to a higher degree of functionality contemporarily. Uh, and then number two, we are making sure uh, that we are true to the historic presence of those buildings on this campus that must always occupy a prominent place uh, on the Morgan campus. Excellent, excellent, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Warwick, you uh, mentioned earlier uh, about uh, some of the richness of, uh, of the buildings on your campus uh, have been recognized nationally in that they're listed on the Registry of Historic Places. Uh, and and uh, I would like for you to uh, comment a little bit about uh, your uh, vision, your development plan uh, to, uh, to uh, increase uh, facilities on your campus, but also do it in such a way uh, that it does not uh, uh, enter the integrity of your historic structures. 
And lastly, it would be my hope that all of our HBCUs will ultimately seek the kind of recognition that uh, that you have there at uh, uh, at Stillman College in terms of being listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Yes, well, I'm happy to share. Um, we have a master planning team similar to uh, what President Wilson was sharing, and our master plan team works with the um, historic architects. As you know, when you in the National Register, there's lots of restrictions in terms of maintaining that historic character. And so that's prominent in our in our minds because that funding um, we're eligible for, we have to adhere to those building uh, requirements. And so most of our historic campus in the district is in the quad at the very front of the campus. So it takes up, you know, a big bulk and the quad has very old magnolia trees, huge magnolia trees that, um, you know, share this space with these historic structures. Um, as you know, historic preservation is very expensive and it takes a long time to do because once you start working on one piece, you find out that something else is wrong. That's where we are with Shepherd Library and the columns. Um, we got some funding from the state of Alabama to work on the facade and the roof and the, the um, oh, I forget what you call those, the awnings. It's kind of like uh, the fascia board. And when we started to take the paint off of the the columns, you know, which came from the original plantation house. So those columns are older than Stillman. There, they were. That house was built in 1837. So those columns and capitals, we were able to. They were able to take the the wrought iron capitals off and restore them. But when we were trying to restore the columns. They have lead-based paint on them, so we were removing the paint. Found out there are a lot of cracks and other kind of fissures on the columns. So now we've had to have our architect come in and make recommendations on what we need to do to protect the integrity of the columns before we can put the capitals back on the the built on the on the top of them. So. It's a, a slow process, certainly it's a very expensive process and and just um, you know knowing that these very delicate um, historic structures that contribute to these buildings are you know we have to as much as possible, go back to the original type of materials that are used or preserve existing historic materials that exist on the building. So we can't take the windows out and put in uh, new windows. We can't, you know, <laughs> we can't take the doors off. Uh, we, we have to find aesthetic ways to deal with the American Disabilities Act. Some of these buildings are um, grandfathered in, so they don't have to have the ADA requirements, but we do have to be mindful of the, the, the people that come to the building. So we do have to find innovative ways to access the space by wheelchair and other persons with disabilities. So it's it's very uh, challenging to have these structures and certainly our master plan team works closely with architects and planners in order to ensure the the historic integrity is retained but also in new buildings that they complement the existing campus architecture. So just like uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned, we, we, we have a lot of red brick or, you know, other, 
you know, in different periods of time, buildings from the 20s, then the 40s, then the 50s, and, and now, you know, the 60s, and now the, the, you know, the 21st century architecture is different. So we try to, to um, complement the existing historic um, campus so that, you know, it doesn't look like you, when you come on the campus, you're, you know it's all Stillman. It doesn't look like someplace from a different century. So, and, it, and it's difficult to do and very expensive to do. Excellent. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hampton, you spoke earlier about uh, your plans and vision in terms of uh, continuing to uh, expand the physical assets of, uh, of, your, uh, of your campus. You may want to just elaborate a little bit on that. Yes, I, I I want I want to go back to your original question when you when you when you set the question up for uh, Dr. Uh, Wilson, and um, and you you ask uh, how do you go about this? Uh, the, yes, the, the the first word or words that popped into my head uh, were very carefully. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I, I yes. literally the the yes. first thought that came to my mind. <laughs> was was when we were needing to replace the windows in Cleves Hall, and uh, Cleves uh, Cleves Hall is a residence hall. It was historically the female residence hall, and at the time that uh, it was uh, it was built in um, in 1921, it was uh, it coincided with the building of the steam the steam plant and so um the the uh, it was one of those moments in history where you could live at lane college live in a residence hall and you had steam heat and so i am uh, fond of saying that we were uptown <laughs> i mean it was it was the place to live uh on <laughs> on campus in uh yes. in 19 <laughs> in 1920, 21. But when we got ready to change those windows, it was just more than a notion. It, it took us the better part of a year to plan it. And then, uh, and then to find a, a contractor uh, who had nerve enough to execute it. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were able to, able to find, find both and able to get the windows replaced. And so that when you look at the photo that's in my conference room right behind me, and you look at the current uh, Cleves Hall, the buildings look, uh, look uh, the same. Uh, we did not uh, impact the, the historicity of it. Um, this, this work is just, uh, just a unique work and it's an exciting work. I have the benefit of serving, and I mentioned earlier, I'm in Bray Hall, that to uh, students of a generation, they consider this building uh, the administration building. They don't know it as, 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 Bray, as Bray Hall. And it was renovated in the early uh, 2000s. And for those students of a generation who will come and during homecoming and meet me in my office, they will tell me that this office was their math class. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I am honored to, uh, to serve in their, in their math class. Now you see these floors uh, that are behind me. I believe you can see these floor. Now these are new floors, but if you just step right outside in the foyer of this office, you will see the floors, the original floors, the hundred plus year old floors uh, that, uh, that were for students of that generation that continue uh, to, 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 to today. So I say all that to say, I mean, it is a very, it's just uh, painstakingly careful work that we do to um, maintain our facilities. In the same way that my colleagues have master plans, uh, Lane College was, we were uh, blessed to be able to, to receive a grant to uh, plan the restoration of J.K. Daniels Hall. And that is a hall that has just been an absolute 
uh, workhorse of a building for our uh, for our institution. And it's the it is the hall that we are currently uh, looking to uh, looking to restore. It was originally established as the industries and trades uh, building. And it and, and in that building, it had things like it had shoemaking, uh, auto mechanics, tailoring, um, a number of a number of trade agriculture. Um, and as I as I think about it, and I think about the history, currently we are a liberal arts uh, institution, but we have we kind of cycle back around to thinking about how, as a liberal arts institution. Do we prepare students to, or how we, how do we pre prepare students to work in industries that are highly technical? And so, in response to that, we have established our Career Pathways Initiative, which uh, allows students who are pursuing liberal arts baccalaureate degrees an opportunity to develop stackable technical credentials in some cases that would prepare them to uh, compete for entry-level jobs, say in, in manufacturing or the technology or the digital space um, that would allow them to get in, in the door so that then they could use their higher order skills that we teach them in the liberal arts, the, the scholar skills, scholar habits, the thinking, the theoretical kind of skills, uh, they could get in the door and then they can use that skill set uh, as well. So it is it is interesting to me that we have cycled all the way back around to the original purpose for that building. That building for us has served over the years. And let me go quickly. It, it has served for us as the Industries and Trades building. But shortly there, thereafter, it was in, in established in 19, built in 1923. But by 1928, uh, a floor of it was being used as a library. Um, that was on the president uh, lane, uh, our founders, one of our founders' uh, sons. And then later, uh, under uh, President Kirkendall, it was renovated in the early 1950s, and the entire building uh, was used as, as a library. Uh, now today, it is used as a building where we have a number of services. Our security is in there. And as a, and it serves as an office building and provides some some services to our to our campus community. But as we think about it in the future, and as a part of our master plan, we are reconceiving how we might use that building, and beginning to move back to its original use in a modern day sense, as a as a modern day industries industries and trades building where students are able to. Um, do one-stop shopping and earn stackable credentials. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. It is uh, so inspiring just to reflect on the richness of our legacy as manifested by our historically black college and universities, those that are, that are privately endowed and those that are state supported and uh, it, it, it's just a fascinating history. And interestingly enough, uh, part of one campus is uh, administered directly um, by the National Park Service. And that is the Tuskegee Institute uh, National Historic Site, uh, which uh, encompasses the Oaks, the home of President uh, Booker T. Washington, built by the students, uh, and the library and laboratory used by uh, Dr. George Washington Carver, again, built uh, by the students. And when the Congress passed legislation authorizing uh, the Tuskegee Institute's historic site as a unit of park system, uh, that elevated uh, the richness of uh, our HBCUs in the Hall of Congress and to remind us that we should, as a nation, have a perpetual responsibility of preserving uh, this rich chapter in, in our collective history. Uh, I uh, want to share with the uh, listening audience uh, that I want to commend e each of you and your respective campuses for being a recipient of the HCCU grant uh, under the uh, Cultural Heritage Stewardship Institute uh, administered uh, by Brent Legg and uh, Miss Tiffany uh, Talbert. So congratulations on that. 
And I'm sure that uh, uh, Brett and, and colleagues will be looking favorably upon new requests for further funding. I hope Brett, Brett picks up on that. The last question is, as I said before, we are certainly indebted to, uh, to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We're in, indebted to the uh, National Council on Historic Preservation, the National Park Service, and, and many of the other and many other organizations that have contributed. Uh, but uh, we we must continue to to build upon uh, the past and and the present and going forward. So let me ask sort of a, a general question, is that uh, as president and uh, leaders of uh, three of our leading uh, universities and colleges, uh, and, and, and knowing that you contribute to the social, cultural, and economic health of your individual states and individual communities, what are your ideas and needs for growing historic preservation impacts on your campuses? In other words, if you could leave with this national audience and perhaps an international audience with one big idea or suggestion to support your efforts, what would that one big idea, what would be that vision, what would be that dream? And let me just pigeonhole the thought too that in 2026, uh, we will we will celebrate, we will observe, we will commemorate the good, bad, and indifference of the 250th anniversary of the founding of this nation. I am very privileged to serve as an advisory member of a council established by the organization responsible for planning uh, jointly with the states, their political subdivision, and others, how we may commemorate in 2026 the 250th fifth anniversary. And I would like to be able to put it on the table uh, how we as a nation can stand and, and salute and recommit ourselves to preserving the richness of our historically black college and universities. Uh, so I would uh, invite you to give me your vision, your dream, your hope uh, that uh, that I can carry to, to, to uh, the leaders uh, in the national, uh, at the national level as to where we can uh, individually collectively recommit ourselves to preserving, again, the legacy of our HBCUs. Start with you, uh, Dr. Warwick. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all of the insight and experience that you've shared throughout all of your time in historic preservation and certainly as an HBCU alum. Uh, I was thinking while you were talking about what you said about the preservation and practice, and, and that's what we think about learning by doing. And I was just, uh, you know, the National Trust in their Saving Places HBCU grant program, they did provide funds to hire a, an existing student to work on the planning of these projects. And I think that was a great step forward in terms of getting more knowledge about historic preservation out there to these students. And we just need to do more of that. But the other area that I think could gain some attention would be through um, environmental justice. And, um, you know, when we think about environmental justice and you think about, you know, like what uh, Logan Hampton said about where our institutions are located in those communities that have uh, no investment from anywhere. And, um, you know, that's to me, it's an environmental justice issue. It's an environmental justice issue when we allow these historic properties to go um, un unrepaired and, and un unrestored. And so I think we need to have um, the historic preservation of HBCUs part of the environmental justice conversation, part of the federal government's environmental justice working group 
uh, really, so we can have multiple agencies contributing to support these campuses, these national treasures, these landmarks that contribute not only to the National Park Service's mission, but also education, energy, uh, environmental protection, um, you know, health and human services, you know, Department of Defense, all of these agencies have a role to play in, in improving the environmental justice uh, at HBCUs and certainly having historic preservation as part of that, um, that dialogue and action. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Dr. Hampton? Yes, I'm, I was pleased that- Your vision, your yeah, dream. <laughs> I, I, I was pleased that you began that with uh, Dr. Warwick, who she has uh, been really my mentor in, in kind of thinking big about how to engage um, agencies, governments, et cetera, in, in helping us to solve uh, our, our problems. I do want to uh, just lift up uh, this notion just a reminder that this is our this is our nation all of us it, it belongs to all of us and these institutions these historically black colleges and universities are all of ours they are all of our institutions and because they exist uh, some would argue we have a we have a black middle class uh, because they exist our nation has been sustained uh, be because they exist, we we are an exceptional nation, and as a result, they these institutions deserve our investments. I do want to particularly I, I I neglected celebrating. Thank you, uh, Dr. Warwick, for again uh, reminding me that our students have been very much engaged in this process, in these processes, and in this conversation about historic preservation. It's been a part of our historic uh, or history seminars. I had two uh, two seniors, uh, Tariq uh, McKenzie and Shay Thompson, uh, who are graduates, who um, who established a piece and for our project with J.K. Daniels, have lifted J.K. Daniels up as a, as a founder uh, of our of our institution. Um, just uh, Chase uh, uh, Chase Cameron uh, is on the planning team. Uh, he's a senior this year. He's on the planning team for the future plans of J.K. Daniels, working with our architectural uh, group. Um, I was meeting with a group of scholars about about another matter uh, just just uh, last week, and uh, the the historic uh, St. Paul CME Church, where many uh, Lane students of a generation attended chapel, is now a building owned by the college. Uh, it is not on the historic register. And I had two students, uh, Keith and, and Tiffany, who who asked the question, well, how do we get a student, how do we get a, a building on the historic register? And how can and how can we help? Those students are very much interested. Our students are very much interested uh, in this work. And the the means and ways in which uh, the government and others can provide um, resources and opportunities for those students to engage fully uh, would be helpful to us at, at this level. And I'll, I'll, I'll yield there. I know our time is getting close. Yes, thank you very much. Dr. Wilson, please. All right, so let me echo what both of my colleagues have said. I think the ideas are uh, quite uh, original and compelling. Uh, I, I would just offer perhaps three things to think about. Um, uh, number one, um, there is no accredited um, preservation program uh, at an HBCU. Uh, and this particular industry is largely white and largely male, and it is grossly underrepresented. And um, I'm, I'm not being self-serving, <laughs> the president, but, uh, but we believe that Morgan is um, 
the only uh, HBCU with this kind of broad academic mission and preservation, uh, which includes training for students in architecture and landscape architecture and planning in construction management and engineering and history and museum studies. And so uh, we are seeking here to become a national leader uh, in training black preservation professionals, uh, leveraging this broad academic mission of ours uh, through the efforts of Professor Dale Green uh, in our School of Architecture and Planning, who by the way is a descendant uh, of one of our founders, Reverend Samuel Green. Um, we are moving forward to hopefully formally establish the first historic preservation program at an HBCU in the country. That's number one. Um, number two, um, in terms of another kind of idea to grapple with, um, I, um, I, I, of course, have, as you know, I've said in this conversation, I, I really began to uh, understand um, historic preservation uh, as an undergraduate student at Tuskegee. Um, and I could not uh, leave uh, the Oaks uh, and uh, Hollis Burke for sale library uh, and uh, the laboratory of George Washington Carver. I mean, I, I was just overwhelmed by the history. And so uh, even as an undergraduate and we would go and visit other HBCUs, um, I tried to connect that history that I was living every single day uh, with what I was being exposed to on some of the other HBCU campuses. And wow, you know, I could have emerged from those experiences being the most educated undergraduate student in America about African-American history without having taken 20 academic credits just from those experiences. And so I would say, hmm, is it worth um, serious cogitation uh, for us to think about uh, something that we may call um, a national HBCU historic trail, uh, where um, the goal of public-private partnership may be to raise $50 billion, I throw it out there, $50 billion, uh, and then connect the story of, if you will, the maturation of America seen through the eyes of the HBCU places and map that trail out so individuals can begin to kind of travel this country uh, in a very organized way, be exposed to these stories, if you will, from Cheney University outside of Philadelphia, perhaps all the way over to Langston University in Oklahoma, right? And so you put together that trail very carefully, the dollars would be raised in, I do think there should be, I mean, billions of dollars more from the federal government uh, coming in through the National Park Service or through the National Trust for Historic Preservation. But I think um, there's an opportunity here for a serious public-private partnership that could have a large goal that then when that is invested on the on each of the individual campuses would go in the vernacular a hell of a long way uh, in helping us to seriously protect these legacies and then at the same time uh, create this powerful narrative uh, that uh, we begin to expose um, a large swath of America to that you know, they may not, depending on how things go, may not even get this in the history books of their local K-12 schools if, for example, some of the stuff that I'm hearing that's taking place in some of these states, if it were to continue, that that could be wiped out of the history books. And then all of a sudden, what do we have? A country that is bereft of a significant portion of his history. And I think we need to get out in front of that uh, and preserve these stories uh, and uh, elevate them to a higher level of consciousness on the part of our nation. Excellent, excellent. Let me thank uh, on behalf of the uh, National Trust for Historical Preservation, you individually and collectively uh, for your insights, your wisdom, your leadership, your accomplishment, and your unwavering commitment 
to stay on the journey. Oh, this has been uh, so, so uplifting. Uh, I'm privileged to serve as a member of the uh, Advisory Council for uh, the Cultural Heritage uh, Preservation Fund under the leadership of uh, Brent. And also a fellow member is uh, the Honorable Jim Clyburn. And over the course of my Park Service career, work very closely with him. As you know, he's a graduate of South Carolina State, and he's been one of the strongest supporters of the appropriations for HBCUs that administered by the National Park Service. And uh, over the past 20, 30 years, something like uh, roughly under $90 million have been awarded to, to HBCUs. And I think in this year's appropriation, it's $10 million. And uh, as long as Jim, I mean, Congressman Clive is there, I think that he'll continue to influence his colleagues. Uh, just th This has just been absolutely uh, outstanding. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wilson, <laughs> I, I have recorded your suggestion uh, for a uh, national trail, the historic trails of HBCUs. And I was privileged as uh, the director uh, to, uh, to uh, administer the which was approved on my watch, the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And uh, this could be something similar and it will give prominence. Oh, it would give great prominence. So with your permission, I'm gonna take that forth as something that uh, should be considered by my colleagues in the uh, Park Service, the Advisory Council and the Trust. And uh, I, I like this, I like this very much. And I think it's, uh, it will happen. Oh, it is fantastic. So again, we could go on for days, and I, I hope that we'll continue to uh, stay connected. Uh, President Wilson, you uh, made reference to, uh, oh, she's her spirit burns deeply within each of us. Uh, her legacy is not only commemorated at the place of her birth on the plantation in Eastern Maryland, but she's also commemorated in, at uh, a similar historic site in a last place of residence in New York, and I speak of none other than Harry Tutman. And uh, so again, I would uh, salute you. I encourage you in the words of Harry Tutman, simply this, keep going, keep going. When things are difficult, <laughs> keep going. We cannot do less if we are to honor our ancestors and encourage this in future generations. I am so proud and so privileged to have been a part of this family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.